Zurich 2010. The announcement of which country will host the single biggest sporting event in the world is about to be handed down. The winner to organize the 222 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. In that moment, exhilaration for Qatar and shattering disappointment for the other delegates. You can see it on their faces. And that's because Qatar is far from being a powerhouse in world football. In fact, it's never even qualified for the finals. But the other countries it was competing against, their footballing prowess was on the up and up. Here's Aloisi for a place in the you World Cup. For us. He's yeah! scored! Including Australia, which has qualified for every World Cup final since 2006. And every one of those countries spent big on their bids. Some high-profile names joined the cause. G'day, I'm Hugh Jackman. There was even a cup-stealing kangaroo. This country spent more than $40 million on the failed campaign, and it was knocked out in the first round of voting. Very disappointed, shattered. I have a lot of uh, misgivings. Not that we're bitter, right? But let's take a look at why Qatar was selected, and what makes this World Cup so different from the others. Long before the envelope was opened, this tiny oil-rich nation's candidacy was controversial. Qatar had no real history in the world game. It's a country of just 2.8 million people. It's situated on a peninsula in the Arabian Sea, dotted with massive sand dunes and salt pans. Fossil fuels have made it one of the richest countries per capita. Summer temperatures in Doha in June and July, when the World Cup is typically held, often hit 45 degrees and above. Obviously not ideal for the players or the fans. So because of that, it was decided that the event would be moved to November and December when temperatures are usually more comfortable in the mid-twenties. That might not seem like a big deal, but it has massive roll-on effects for professional league schedules around the world, especially in Europe where 13 of the 32 World Cup teams come from. The former head of the German Football Federation went so far as to say a change in playing schedules does not only affect the Bundesliga but continues affecting lower divisions due to the link with promotion and relegation. The game Pyramid, he said, is in danger and so is the unity of German football. And the Germans are not alone. The UEFA Champions League qualifiers will be moved forward to November. Italy's Serie A and the Spanish La Liga will extend their seasons till June. The English Premier League will take a six-week hiatus, which is not ideal for individual or team performance. One commentator wrote that insisting that the World Cup should be moved to winter equals admitting that the candidate for a summer World Cup should never have been considered. Still, the hopes in Qatar were high from the outset. Meanwhile, back at FIFA HQ in Zurich, officials were taking a gamble, promising something different with the first World Cup to be played in the Middle East. Thank you for believing in change. Thank you for believing in expanding the game. Thank you for giving Qatar a chance. And we will not let you down. So I'm a happy president when we speak about development of football. Now, development of the sport is an attractive dividend for the host country and the governing body, but the winning bid also came with a massive spending plan. Qatar will have shelled out about $220 billion. Let that sink in for a moment. $220 billion. That dwarfs what was spent by the previous hosts, Russia in 2018, Brazil in 2014, and South Africa in 2010, combined. And with just a modest domestic league, Qatar's deep pockets would come in handy to build seven new world-class stadiums and refurbish another. Plus, there's all the infrastructure outside the venues, transport and accommodation for more than a million spectators. 
the city of Lusail, that's scheduled to host the final match, didn't even exist at the time of the bid. It's a completely planned city that's being built just for the World Cup. And remember, the population of the entire country is only 2.8 million people, which brings us to the next challenge. The workforce that's needed to build all of this. Qatar relies on foreign labour. Amnesty International estimates 1.7 million migrant workers make up 90% of the country's workforce. These labourers mostly come from Bangladesh, India, Pakistan and Nepal. Their workplace rights, conditions and treatment has been questioned by human rights groups because of the Kafala sponsorship-based employment program, which had legally tied workers to their employers. Human Rights Watch has been documenting some of their experiences. Being a migrant worker in Qatar sometimes is like being in an open air gym. It looks like you are free, but in a way you are locked in. Analysis by The Guardian in 2021 revealed that at least 6,500 migrant workers had died in Qatar since the World Cup was awarded. The Qatari government disputes that figure and insists there have only been 37 deaths among labourers at World Cup stadium construction sites and that only three were work-related. The International Labour Organisation asserts this is a severe underestimate because Qatar doesn't count deaths from heart attacks and respiratory failure as being work-related, even though these are common symptoms of heat stroke which is what can happen when you're doing hard labour in high temperatures. And while the tournament may have been moved to the Qatari winter, don't forget construction was still happening all year round, including in the peak of summer. In 2017, Qatar's government agreed to improve working standards, introduce minimum wages and it's promised other reforms. It's even released glossy promotional videos pledging to raise the bar for workers' welfare and the efforts to keep them cool while they work. But there's more, like the rights of women. Despite a pledge to move towards greater gender equality, a male guardianship system still exists. The rules are complicated, but they give men control over women from making their own decisions on things such as marriage or travel. There's also a ban on same-sex relations. Homosexuality is illegal in Qatar. People can be jailed and under Sharia law could be sentenced to death for homosexual acts, which is not the kind of progressive modern image FIFA wants at its showpiece event. And that also goes for the big brands involved in lucrative sponsorships. Do you have everything you need to believe? Australia's Josh Cavallo, who became the first active men's professional football player to come out as gay, has reservations about the World Cup being held in Qatar. Yeah, it does concern me because it's like even with the World Cup, you know, if I if I represent Australia at the World Cup, and I'm pushing for that, and if I get, uh, you know, it would be an honour to go to the World Cup, but at the same time, you know, it's it's the laws that clash. But no problem, says the Emir of Qatar. We welcome everybody, but also we expect and we want people to respect our culture. The treatment of workers, women and LGBTQI plus people led to calls for countries to boycott the cup, but so far, none of them have. During qualifying matches, Norway and Germany staged protests using t-shirts carrying messages promoting human rights. And during the tournament, the Denmark national jersey will be all black to one of the workers who died during construction. But whose job is it to police all this stuff anyway? I mean, are we supposed to look to FIFA to be the standard bearer of human rights and freedoms? Because alongside all of this, FIFA's had a bit of a whiff about it for some time when it comes to its own affairs. Qatar's bid has never quite been able to shake off the allegations of corruption. From the outset, officials have insisted everything was above board. When people say, how did you win the World Cup? You know, the simplest answer, and I, and I assure you and I promise you, it is not said in any way with any arrogance. We were the best bid. 
But even before Cutter's bid came along, FIFA was engulfed in claims of bribery and kickbacks. Over the years, top names associated with the world governing body have been named, shamed and suspended. In 2015, a dawn raid on a luxury hotel in Zurich saw several FIFA executives and associates indicted by the US Justice Department, resulting in charges of racketeering, wire fraud and money laundering. And remember this guy, Sepp Blatter? Well, within days of winning a fifth term as FIFA's president, Let's go FIFA! Let's go FIFA! In almost 17 years in the job, he resigned. He was facing a separate investigation in Switzerland over a disloyal payment. A comedian even interrupted a media conference at FIFA HQ to shower the outgoing chief in fake cash. This has nothing to do with football. Two of the sport's most powerful figures, Sepp Blatter and Michael Platini, the former UEFA president, who was at the time a potential successor to Blatter, would be handed eight-year bans by the FIFA Ethics Committee. They were also charged with fraud by Swiss authorities, only to be later acquitted in court. And then, in 2020, the US Justice Department alleged corruption was involved in Qatar's World Cup bid. It accused three FIFA executives of taking bribes to vote for the Gulf state to host the tournament. Ultimately, more than half of the 22 men who voted for Qatar were later accused of or charged with corruption. Qatar's Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy of the World Cup didn't hold back. The Supreme Committee maintains, it says, that it strictly adhered to all the rules and regulations for the 2018-2022 FIFA World Cup bidding process and that any claim to the contrary was baseless and would be fiercely contested. Despite the claims and denials, Qatar has been spending big and making big promises. We have taken a comprehensive and innovative approach to make sure we provide an inclusive and fair experience catalyze economic development and deliver world-class environmental solutions. As part of that $220 billion bill, it's building arenas that organisers say are in line with international standards and principles. They're promising to stage the first fully carbon neutral World Cup featuring energy efficient and air conditioned stadiums all within a 50 kilometre radius of Doha to cut down on the need for long distance travel. As for the infrastructure, Qatar wants it to be sustainable, learning lessons from Brazil in 2014 and the Olympics two years later, where, despite the costs, many venues became white elephants, unused and falling into disrepair. To prevent that this time, World Cup 2022 venues have modular elements and can be reconfigured to make them more suitable for entertainment or the region's more popular sporting events. Upper seating tiers will be removed and donated to other countries. Then there's Stadium 974. It's a temporary facility built with 974 shipping containers. And after the final whistle, it'll be pulled apart and repurposed. So, you've got the venues. Now you need a big name to promote your event. Qatar has surprised me with a wide range of great experiences you can have in just 48 hours. Enter David Beckham, the face of Qatar, in an eye-poppingly lucrative deal to promote tourism and culture in the region. This is perfection for me. The former England captain's 200 million US dollar deal to be an ambassador raised eyebrows because he's championed a lot of humanitarian causes over the years and he's also considered a bit of a gay icon. There have been calls for Beckham to use his status to shed light on social issues in Qatar. But for now at least, he's staying on message. This game is for everybody. And that's why it's important that it does go to different territories, that it does go to different countries, that it does go to new places that have never been able to host a competition like this. Even the pointy issue of alcohol has been addressed in a country where there are strict rules around consumption. There was a compromise because of this major sponsor. Fans will be able to drink in a dedicated Doha fan zone 
and ticket holders will have options within the stadium grounds before and after a match in the evenings, but not inside, where there'll only be alcohol-free offerings. So here's the big question. Will any of these issues stop fans around the world tuning in? Unlikely. The world's attention will be fixed on Qatar as 32 teams play 64 games over 28 days. FIFA expects 5 billion people to watch around the globe, up from 3.5 billion last time in Russia. Qatar is certainly not the first country to put on a big shiny event and gloss over all the other stuff going on just below the surface. Some call it sports washing, like when China had a Uyghur athlete light the cauldron at the Beijing Winter Games, or even when Berlin hosted the Summer Olympics in 1936. We can't take away from the fact that this is a first for the Middle East, a chance for the world game to be a bit more global. To what end? We don't know yet. But it is a prize that's been won on the back of thousands who've suffered and died for someone else's sporting glory.